In demonology, there exists a demon thought to be a lieutenant of Satan, one who was dispatched on various missions, usually to deceive mortals through a varied set of methods, none the least taking the form of a beautiful woman and using their naked glory to seduce men to his cause. While seldom depicted, his true form is thought to be one of utter terror, a demon with huge horns, sharp teeth, long nails, and the embodiment of something truly awful. His name is Belfagor, and if you asked Peter Binsfield, a bishop who wrote the classification of demons, Belfagor is one of the seven princes of hell, and is the chief demon of the sin of sloth. But what is sloth? Well, it's widely regarded that sloth is the state of doing nothing, the state of physical and spiritual abandonment, where one may find that doing the absolute least is fulfilling. It's quite easy to see why sloth would be a sin, in that squandering one's own potential and life by doing nothing is almost like throwing the gift of life back in God's face. It is also through sloth that the mind and the body is neglected, again another form of ungratefulness towards what God has given, as well as the potential for the devil to infiltrate one's mind. The devil makes work for idle thumbs, as the saying goes, and this directly links to sloth, in that if one is passive, they may be perceptible to the devil's tricks, and possibly even serve him by being so acquiescent. Sloth is also the want for the easy path, a path that God may not wish you to take. Believers often attribute the hardships in life to the will of God, in that God wants his subjects to endure the roughness of existence so as to better them and make them stronger. The sloth is unwilling to do this, and therefore denies God of what he wants by doing nothing at all. The sloth does not worship God, takes for granted the life he has been given, and dodges God's will because of the effort it takes to implement. An example of this appears in the Old Testament, where Jonah is asked to go to Nineveh, and to bring upon them a prophecy against them, for the great wickedness that has taken place there. Jonah demonstrates sloth because he really doesn't want to do this, and even goes as far as to try and escape his duty by sailing in the opposite direction. Through this, Jonah takes the easy way out, ease being something the sloth craves for, more than he does for salvation. Whilst Belphegor does not appear under such a name in the Bible, many are convinced that he goes by the name Baal Pior, or Baal Pior, in Numbers 25, which sees the Israelites settle in the ancient Jordan city, known as Shatim, a town that was often pegged as being a site of debauchery, sin, and orgies. Whilst here, the Israelite men begin to indulge in sexual immorality, with the Moabite women living here, those that invite the men to sacrifice to their gods. Numbers tells us that the men ate their sacrificial meals and even bowed before the gods of the Moabite women, where we are told, So Israel yoked themselves to the bowel of Pure, and the Lord's anger burned them. But who or what is this bowel of Pure? Whilst it does sound similar to the demonic name of Belphegor, it does have some significance in the Bible. Baal Pure, or the Baal of Pure, was a local deity worshipped by the Moabites, and could very well be the Belphegor that we know from Peter Binsfield's classification as the Demon of Sloth. As mentioned, Baal Pure appears when the Israelites who were following Moses to the Promised Land are seduced by the women of Shatim into worshipping their god. The story starts further back when the king of the Moabites, known as Balak, hired Balaam, a wicked prophet, to curse Israel. King Balak, after all, had seen the advancement of the Israelites and began to see how formidable they could become, thus wishing to destroy them. The prophet Balaam was paid, but his curses had no effect on Israel, as each time he tried, God converted the curse into a blessing. It would see Balaam actually bestow blessings upon Israel seven times, the exact opposite of what King Balak had intended. King Balak and the wicked prophet Balaam would spy on Israel from a peak known as Pure, and they come to understand that cursing Israel is pointless, because God protects Israel from such attempts. So the terrible tag team of Balak and Balaam decide to hatch up a new plan. We learn in Numbers 25, as mentioned earlier, that the women in the team begin to seduce the Israeli men on their way to the Promised Land. They encourage the men to sacrifice to their gods and to worship them, that which took place in many sexual acts. As mentioned, we are told in Numbers 25 1-3, while Israel was staying in Shatim, 
the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Midianite women, who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meals and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the bowel of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Numbers 31.16 tells us, They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in the Peor incident, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. And by this, we learn that the women were actually working under the prophet Balaam's orders. It would seem that as Balaam was unable to curse the Israelites, he used the women to seduce the Israelites into worshipping Baal Peor instead, knowing full well that this would anger God, and thus see them cursed, as King Balak had intended. Through this, Balaam is actually able to complete his mission by manipulating pretty much everyone involved, including God, into getting that which he wants. The word Peor is thought to mean opening, and as mentioned, is the name of the mountain in which Balak and Balaam spied on the Israelites. Where this term opening fits into the story is not known. Perhaps it is referring to the opportunity that Balaam waits for in order to exact his plan, the opening of an opportunity. Or maybe there was a cave on the mountain from which Balaam and Balak spied on the Israelites, thus the term opening. The term might also have some sexual connotation, given that the women of the area seduced the Israelite men through sex, and that this opening refers quite simply to the penetration during intercourse. The word Baal, or Baal, we've seen used many times throughout the Bible, and it is thought to mean Lord or Master. Baal, or Baal, was also thought to be the name of the Canaanite gods, and that there were many Baals or Canaanite lords. You'll notice that Baal Peor is often referred to as the Baal of Peor, suggesting that there are other Baals of other areas. In any case, Numbers 25.4 tells us that The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. Here God tells Moses, the leader of the Israelites, to kill the Midianite leaders, given that they had managed to deceive the Israeli men with their women, and Moses is quick to facilitate this command. We are told, So Moses said to the Israeli judges, Each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the bowel of Peor. Moses also sees to the death of many of the Israelite men who were deceived, and continues with his persecution of the Midianites, where God tells him in Numbers 25, 17-18, The Lord said to Moses, Treat the Midianites as enemies and kill them. They treated you as enemies when they deceived you in the pure incident. With Moses condemning those that were seduced by the women to death, it shows us how seriously God took the worshipping of other gods and the intimate acts of sex that took place under these circumstances. In fact, we are told that by the time Moses was done condemning the Israelites to death, the toll was 24,000 lives. We understand that many of these deaths came about due to a plague, but it is also disputed as to whether Moses summoned the plague from God, from which to purge the Israelites of what would have been considered their weakest links. Frequently, we see this pure incident referred to in other stories in the Bible, but it isn't always clear whether Baal Pure is being referred to as a being or a place. Deuteronomy mentions Baal Pure in chapter 4 as both a place and a being, where the incident is referred to by Moses, telling us, You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Pure. The Lord, your God, destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Pure. The use of the preposition at tells us that Baal Pure is a place, and yet the use of the second preposition of tells us that this Baal was an entity representing the noun or place that is pure. Hosea 9.10 sees Baal Pure referred to as a place, where it is said, When they came to Baal Pure, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol, and became as vile as the thing they loved. Psalm 106.28, however, refers to the Baal of Pure as a being, telling us, They yoked themselves to the Baal of Pure, and ate sacrifices offered to lifeless gods. So, with that out of the way, it could be said that the demon Belphegor is named after the Baal of Peor, he who got his name from the Moabites and the Midianites who worshipped him, or by the Israelites who named him so, after they had been manipulated by him and his women. The event marks a critical incident where the Israelites succumb to immorality and adultery, 
and also saw them give in to the temptation of the flesh. Not only is this story a warning to believers that God is angered by such debauchery, it also provides us with an explanation as to why many believe that the demon Belphegor is thought to use women to manipulate men. Sexual temptation has never changed over time. It has always been an urge for men and women to indulge in and represent the basic carnal need of humankind, one that can consume us if we allow it. Through this, Belphegor the demon is believed to be that very entity that corrupts society with this sin, utilising the naked flesh of women to deceive and manipulate men. Some might say that the Midian women were not real at all, but instead manifestations of Belphegor or the Baal of Peor, in which was able to corrupt several of the Israelites simultaneously. Through this, Belphegor can be considered a shapeshifter, as aforementioned taking the form of a beautiful woman and seducing men on behalf of his lord Satan, as he seeks to knock righteous men off the path of salvation. In a legend unassociated with the Bible, the demon Belphegor is thought to have been sent by Satan onto earth to discover the secrets of marital love and to find out if love was actually real. He was also tasked with learning if love could be used to further manipulate humans. However, he would later return to Satan to tell him that whilst on earth, he could find no true incarnation of love having ever existed, implying that the idea of love is indeed just a fallacy, and that the sensation of being in love is probably just the release of the hormone oxytocin. That or the possibility that no one is really in love, and that we're just afraid to be lonely. It's also possible that Belphegor is incapable of experiencing love, given that he is a demon, and a demon who represents both sloth and seduction. His definition of love may be drastically different to ours. The legend also speaks of his travels on earth and his fondness of the country France, whereby he became enthralled by a sleazy side of Paris. Whilst here in Paris, he was thought to have become an adversary to Mary Magdalene, the patron saint of France. In Jacques Collin de Plancy's Dictionnaire Infernal, he confirms that Belfagor became the ambassador of France. Today it is also believed that Belphegor can be invoked by those who want to find wealth, though without actually having to put the work in, hence him being the demon of sloth. Unlike the demon Marmon of greed, who would want his subjects to incur wealth because of his love for money, Belphegor is often thought to make empty promises. This is because unlike Marmon, he doesn't want those who invoke him to obtain anything and instead seeks to draw humankind into a state of laziness. Regardless of that which he promises the invoker, Belphegor will proceed to subdue them into a state of procrastination, daydreaming, and into essentially wasting their lives. Through this, Belphegor doesn't seem to ever harm those that trigger him, but more so tricks them into harming themselves by way of neglect. It is thought that many people may inadvertently summon Belphegor when they have had a good idea or some kind of invention that will benefit themselves or mankind, but that Belphegor will siphon their creative energy keeping them in a rut. Meanwhile, in Kabbalistic writings, he is thought to be known as the Disputer and the enemy of the six Sephiroth known as Beauty, the manifestation of God's beauty, if you will. This is thought to have come about in some beliefs after he was cast out of heaven, suggesting that Belphegor was once an angel and a member of the Order of Principalities. But let me know in the comments below if you have any other stories about the demon Belphegor and whether you believe he actually exists. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time.